Bannon versus Kushner in the ultimate battle for Donald Trump's soul. Well, at least that's the way it looks if you read the headlines. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott. This is Right Angle for BillWhittle.com, brought to you by our paying members. Thank you so much. We're coming up on a year here. Couldn't be more excited. Anyway, guys, I have this collection of headlines. I'm just going to read you three of them, but I, I, I've got a Google alert that, that that's longer than uh, the USS Missouri, this thing. Uh, here's three of them. CNN says, Steve Bannon's worst week in Washington. Uh, the New Yorker, Steve Bannon is losing to the globalists. And the Chicago Tribune wants us to know, no one has Trump's ear and trust more than Jared and Ivanka. Not... Steve Bannon. And this whole thing started uh, a little over a week ago when the new national security advisor, H.R. Uh, McMaster, who, Scott, you have some familiarity with, uh, demoted Bannon off of the National Security Council. And there was talk, well, uh, this was long planned. It's not a big deal. Even McMaster said that. But that's the kind of thing the White House is supposed to say during a personnel shuffle. Uh, Scott, what's going on here? Is Donald Trump growing in office? Is Bannon on the outs? Have, uh, have, have the globalists beaten the, uh, the, the pro-Putin forces? What's going on here is that politics is sports for ugly people and for weaklings. Um, <laughs> it's, seriously, we, we do not know anything about what's really happening inside. And, and I say that not only, I'm not saying that nobody who leaks information to the Washington Post, for example, or to the Associated Press has any insider information. They just don't have any global insider information. They don't have an overview. They see an incident, you know, somebody elbows somebody out of the way at the, at the executive branch urinal, and all of a sudden they're saying, oh, well, a Bannon must be on the outs. Um, nobody really knows what's going on also because there are people intentionally feeding false information to the media because they want to see what kind of reaction it gets. In fact, Bannon and Priebus may be leaking some of this false information. They may be doing it, in fact, to keep the media focused on this kind of stuff so that they can get substantive things done and so that, you know, the media is not doing any reporting, not that there's a great risk of that. So I, I literally, when I see this stuff happening, you know, you can express an opinion of it. I mean, it's a parlor game. You can sit around and, and you know, espouse some sort of opinion on it. But the reality is none of us really knows what's going on. And initial reports, uh, until somebody winds up being fired, I don't believe anything. Well, okay, let's talk about the uh, the substance then, Scott, uh, on, on actual policy, particularly on uh, uh, trade so far, but certainly on uh, what some might deride as a, a neocon foreign policy with the strike on Syria, with uh, carrier battle groups steaming uh, at full speed towards North Korea. Certainly Bannon's been losing on the policy front, hasn't he? I don't necessarily think any of these actions have broader implications when it comes to, you know, the little, uh, you know, what, what was that show called? The first reality show when they had, it was like a camera in, in somebody's house, Big Brother. Oh, Big Brother, so I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that we all think we're getting the Big Brother camera view and that we really know what's going on, but we don't realize there are all these side rooms where stuff's really happening and the producer is whispering in in the uh, actor's ears and saying, here's, here's what you're supposed to do. So I, I don't necessarily think think that when somebody's profile is is diminished, as it seemed to be when H.R. McMaster had Steve Bannon removed from the Security Council, I don't think that that necessarily means anything in terms of Bannon's longevity there. Um, I, I wish we had those kind of clear signals. But like I said, until Bannon hits the bricks, we don't know. Well, let me tell you what this reminds me of most. Uh, Reagan's first four years in office, uh, 81 to 85, were marked by all kinds of chaos and dissension with, within the White House. It was, it was just, it was a chaotic White House because his, uh, his staff and especially his cabinet were kind of divided between uh, true believers in this Reagan revolution that he dragged the GOP kicking and screaming through and the, the, the not so true believers, the old hands, like, well, like uh, George H.W. Bush. And it was, it was really chaos, but he still got a lot done. Uh, Bill, do you worry about this uh, uh, chaos in the Trump White House? On the contrary, I think it's extremely good news. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, of all the people that are surrounding Donald Trump, Steve Bannon is the only one I don't particularly care for. Uh, I'll probably hear a knock on the door uh, in a few moments, <laughs> but but right but Park you get police. the idea. Open up, no, uh, right? Um, and when um, when somebody who I do respect very highly, like um, McMaster, says uh, no Security Council for you, some people say, "My God, it's turmoil." To me, that's like, no. This is exactly how things are supposed to work. Yes. The the fact that 
the fact and and this reflects very positively on Donald Trump. If this if the, if Donald Trump were this uh, political machine that everybody accuses him of being, then then nothing happens to um, Bannon, right? I mean, Bannon is the golden child. He got him there, and so on, and and he would be protected. And and Trump would say, "Who are you to say that you know this guy's getting thrown off the Security uh, Council?" But if he's the kind of president that this is all the evidence so far who picks very, very, very good people to run their departments and then gives them the reign, the free reign to run the department the way they feel like it, that's nothing but good. Nothing, nothing, nothing but good. So I was, I was actually quite pleased about this. And as you say, look, a lot of it's just, you know, grandstanding for, oh, there's tr oh, turmoil course. in the Trump. There's turmoil in the Trump camp. My response to that would be there's adjustments in the Trump camp as we find out that people who've not done these jobs before, how well they do them or how badly they do them. We don't keep some obsolete old lunatic for secretary of state for four years and, you know, and then replace her with some kind of, you know, mummified, uh, you know, uh, giant Oompa Loompa for another four years. <laughs> if things aren't working, we change them. And, and, and that is good management style. And God knows this country hasn't had any management in a long time. And oh, Steve, yeah. let, me, let me add, yeah, I just sure, finished Scott. reading, I just re finished reading H.R. McMaster's Dereliction of Duty. Oh, what and a, what a great if, book. if nothing else, McMaster had to learn in assembling that book about Lyndon Johnson and Rob, Robert McNamara and the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Vietnam War. One of the things he learned was the importance of communication across all the sectors that are concerned with America's national security. Because what Johnson and McNamara essentially did was, or primarily McNamara, McNamara shielded Johnson, the president, from any sort of dissension. He managed the Joint Chiefs of Staff and kept telling them he was going to do what, he, what they wanted to do and to recommend to the president what they wanted the president to do, but he never did. And he kept stringing them along. So all along, there is this constant battle going on at the national security level between the Joint Chiefs of Staff Staff, the director of the CIA, the secretary of defense, and the president above it all just basically said, I want to kill more Viet Cong. What's it take to do that? H.R. McMaster has seen that lesson. So he brings back into that council meeting the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he brings in our U.N. ambassador, Nikki Haley. Uh, he's, he apparently has learned the lessons of the book he wrote. Hey, uh, Bill, help me out here. Uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush's first secretary of defense, uh, I just forgot his name. Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld. A lot to, to like about that guy. He was great in front of the media. He was a uh, he was going to be a great reformer, Secretary of Defense, until of course 9/11 came along. And what Bush should have done at that point was was taken him aside and said, "You're out, Don. You're you're not a wartime consigliere." And 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 brought in somebody who wasn't a reformer, but somebody who was a war fighter. And I got to tell you, I've been joking for years that the the dirtiest the dirtiest word in the English language is policy. Uh, foreign policy, domestic policy, we just, Washington always seems to get it wrong. But now, I gotta tell you, after just uh, 60 or 70 some odd days of the Trump administration, I think the most two beautiful words in the English might be, you're fired. And if Steve Bannon's the next guy out the door, well, there aren't going to be any tears from him in Washington or, or many other places. All right, that's your right angle on the who's in and who's out in the Trump chaos White House, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. If you like what you see, click on over, join yourself. We'd love to have you aboard.